Well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Hope you're ready for another webinar. We've got some neat stuff to go over. I mean, if you've been in any way using Land Effects the last couple of years, I hope you've come across the massive number of blocks that we've added, uh, particularly over uh, the last couple of years. So we have a really fun little webinar to um, go through quite a few things. Um, I have a very quick little uh, housekeeping item. Uh, we are recording this, so it will be available. Um, but we do also, you know, want interaction from you. Uh, we didn't just record this ahead of time and playing the recording. This is live. This is real and we're here. So there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And I actually recommend clicking it right now, like I just did. Um, it's going to make it easier for me to answer your questions. And it's going to be easier for you to see the answers that I type to other people's questions makes a great little companion. And of course, you yourself might have a question. Just get all ready to type it in. Um, so I think that's enough of my yammer yammer. I'm going to give this hand over to James, who's uh, been a part of this uh, content team that has ramped up over the last couple of years. So he's the perfect person to uh, walk us through some blocks. Take it away, James. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for introducing me, Jer. Um, as Jer informed us, we'll be talking about blocks today and uh, what makes them so useful. Uh, my name is James. Uh, there's a pretty bad photo of myself. Um, I'm a content creator. Uh, I help on the manufacturer relations team and uh, I support our usage text. Um, so our overview for the presentation today is going to be uh, four major steps. Um, first, we're going to go over the basics of what a block is and what makes them kind of special. Um, then we're gonna go over how Land Effects uses blocks. Um, and then we're gonna cover some considerations for creating your own blocks or editing your own blocks. And then we're gonna uh, look at how to integrate your own blocks and some of the different ways you can integrate the different types of blocks. So first, let's uh, answer the question, what, it, what is a block? Um, a block is simply a collection of objects combined into a single named object. So you can take all of your components such as line work and uh, hatches and circles and all that fun stuff. And it um, condenses them into a single object. So when you're working in CAD, you only have to manipulate one object. You don't have to deal with moving groups of objects and making sure you have everything sorted out. Um, when you place a block in a drawing, it becomes defined in that drawing. And uh, it's kind of important to understand because it, it's going to um, really impact the workflow and how you uh, work with your blocks. Um, so if you're to place a block in a drawing and you want to edit that block in the drawing, you can do so. And it's going to update all the instances of that block within the drawing. But that does not actually change the source block. So if you were to place that drawing or that block into another drawing, you would see that it still showed up in the original form. It didn't carry over the changes. So we'll, we'll kind of go over that in some more detail. It's just a really important um, aspect that I want to point out early on. Uh, another way to think of this would be um, like using an analogy. Uh, your lines and your hatches and your circles and all of your individual components are going to be more like your ingredients list, that first image you see there. And then when you put them all together and you get a block, it's like, like having a, a finished cake. So now you can run around in your drawing and throw cakes everywhere. Um, and then the block definition is kind of like the recipe. So CAD can easily refer to the recipe book for all of your blocks. And it just makes your life so much easier. Um, there's three major types of blocks. Um, the standard block is probably what you guys are familiar with. Um, and they're, they're pretty much just static, and they are as is. You can rotate, and uh, some of them will scale. Uh, but that's kind of the end of the functionality. Um, and if you look at these images I have set out here on the right, um, you'll notice that each um, type of block, I've shown three images. The uh, first image you see there is going to be uh, what the block appears like in the slide when you're previewing it in CAD. And then the second set of photos, or the second row or column, is what the block looks like when you place it in CAD. And then lastly, the, the third photo is a print preview of what the block will look like when you print it. So um, we kind of are mostly familiar with standard blocks, I would assume, um, but we also have dynamic blocks. Um, they're much like 
uh, your standard static blocks. However, they provide additional functionality. Uh, if you see in that first image there with the door, um, you can tell that it's dynamic in two obvious ways. One would be the little blue dynamic arrow in the top right corner of the slide. That's an easy way to um, identify dynamic blocks as you're browsing through um, the block selection. Um, and the name below the block there, you see there's a D at the end of the name. That's another way you can um, tell that the block is dynamic at a glance. Now, this particular block um, uses visibility states and there are um, a, a number of different ways you can make dynamic blocks using different tools. Uh, but this one just basically uses uh, visibility states which allow you to place the block. And then if you select it, you will see a little drop down arrow and it shows you the uh, available uh, visibility states for that block. So in this case, the block has three uh, standard door widths that you can choose from. Um, so it, it just adds an extra layer of functionality to the block. Um, and then at the bottom, you'll see annotative blocks. Um, annotative blocks will adjust automatically to your viewport. And this is super useful if you're you know, using blocks in paper space or things that uh, will uh, be seen in different scales. So they, uh, will automatically adjust to the scale, kind of taking a lot of that uh, headache away from you. Um, if you look at the second image there, you'll see that that sign, it also has an attribute. So when you're browsing in CAD, um, the attribute will show up as just 000. And then when you place it in CAD, the attribute will prompt you to enter uh, a value. And you can see there, I just chose a local, ho uh, local highway and I just made that one a 101. Um, so, now that we've kind of gone over some basic blocks, why don't we uh, jump over to CAD and I can show you um, some of this stuff in action. Here I have um, some blocks laid out. Um, these are basically a small sample of uh, the different types of blocks that we use in, in AutoCAD uh, or land effects rather. Um, you might be familiar with some of our uh, site plan graphics and our site elevation graphics over here. Um, these are kind of our more just uh, everyday use generic blocks that are uh, pretty easily accessible. Um, and if you can see here on my screen now, um, this is a plan view mailbox. And um, I wanted to use this as an opportunity to really drive home the point about block definitions because this can be kind of confusing until you see it in, in practice. Um, so I have six instances of this block and each one is a cake. So I'm gonna open it in our block editor by double clicking and uh, just make sure I have the correct block selected here. And then I'm gonna open it up and this is our block editor. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn our color off because I, I don't need to look at that for this particular example. Um, so let's say you wanted to modify this mailbox a little bit. Um, let's say you wanted to widen the front of it and give it like a, a different look. Um, something simple like that is totally easy to do. Um, you can go ahead then and, and save your block and when you close the block editor here, voila, now all six of your mailboxes have uh, adopted the change. So it will go through and it'll change that block definition for every instance within my drawing. Um, but the point here is that it did not change the source block definition. So if I were to come over here to a, a, a blank drawing, and um, this is a drawing I've just set up my units on and everything uh, in preparation. And I wanted to place that same mailbox here. Um, it's a site amenity, so mailboxes. You can see here's the same one. And when I place it, it still maintains the original block definition. Um, so if you wanna make changes to a block, you need to uh, make sure that you go to the source block and you edit the block definition at the source. Um, so to make that a little more clear, let me zoom back out. All of our blocks are stored in the cloud, so you don't have to actually download them um, in one massive library. Um, it's very useful because we provide slide files, so you're allowed to you're able to preview the block um, before you ever place it. Um, and this allows us to update our block libraries and make all of our new additions instantly available to you. Um, so if we want to look at a few other types of blocks here. Um, Here's are some more examples of dynamic blocks. You can see this is the door that I had used in my example, and it's a normal block. I can move it and manipulate it with all of my normal tools, 
But if I select it, you see this drop down arrow, I have that additional functionality we discussed. Uh, and I can on the fly change the, the visibility state of that block. Um, this is another example with a bench. Um, you can easily just quickly change the length of it. Um, we have all types of blocks that use this functionality and other dynamic functionality. Um, our architectural uh, elevation windows are nice because we have all the standard sizes set for you, so you don't have to do too much editing. Now, um, I wanted to take a look at discipline graphics. Um, these are normally used on paper space, and I scaled these arbitrarily to make them look good for this video, so don't um, fret about that too much. But what you can see here on the left is I have um, four different work areas. And uh, each one of these work areas has a different scale. Um, they're noted at the top. So you got one inch equals one foot, 10 feet, 20 feet, and 30 feet. And if you see here, this is a block I placed in each um, work area. And you can see how it scales differently. Um, and if you want to see that in action, I can come up here and I can choose discipline graphics. And I can choose my map. And you can see as I move through the work areas, the scale automatically adjusts for me. So I don't have to worry about it. If I wanted to place this block, recall it had an attribute, I can give it a number and say, okay, and boom, it's done for me. And this is uh, one way to use annotative blocks and save yourself a ton of time. Um, and as we get into this some more, it's really important that you understand uh, kind of how we organize our blocks. So I'm going to come up here and I'm going to kind of give you a tour of our block tool. If you go to our site tab and you see this tool here that says blocks, it gives you uh, plan graphics, elevation graphics, discipline, and so on. If I wanted to browse through my plan graphics, I only have to click plan. And uh, you see I have these expandable trees here. So this is where all of our blocks are kept. So if you wanted to uh, explore site furnishings, you could uh, just as easily check out our benches. And you see here you have a preview of the block and it's nice because it provides you with a good amount of detail and it gives you the block name. And uh, these ones are really easily identifiable as dynamic because you have the blue triangle and you have the D at the end of the name. So you can browse through all of these and they're not downloaded yet. Um, it's not until you specifically place one in a drawing that it downloads on demand. So I can kind of just take you through here a little bit and show you some of the blocks that are available and you can kind of see um, how big our block library is and uh, it's always growing. It's a really cool project. We get to do all kinds of fun blocks. Um, recently, we added a whole set of motorcycles and uh, I want to use some of these as an example to show some of the awesome functionality we have um, for placing blocks. So if I wanted to place this motorcycle here. I just have to select him. Sorry, it uh, changed the rotation there on me. I just have to select him and come down here to some open space. So you can see now um, this block will allow me to place it wherever I want. And if I click um, and turn off my ortho mode, I have the ability to rotate it. That's super cool and it's pretty standard. So I'm gonna go ahead and place this guy. Um, but I want to show you how these uh, keyboard commands that we've recently added have kind of changed um, our workflow and really improved our efficiency. So I can press K if you look at my command line down there, it's uh, highlighted in blue. So if I press K, it brings up my keyboard commands. So now without having to leave my block tool uh, at my fingertips, I have a ton of new functionality. Um, I can flip the block. Um, I just basically mirror it. Uh, I can go through views. Um, I can copy blocks along lines, polylines, um, and I can even actually navigate um, from one section to another. This might not be as common of an instance, but you can actually jump between categories. So let me show you some of this functionality. If I wanted to flip the block, all I have to do is press F and then I can flip it. Uh, and if I want to toggle through some of my various views, I just have to press D. And now I get my elevation right view. Uh, and if I go again, I can get a uh, front view of the same block. 
And if I go through again, I get the back view of the same block. So if you were trying to do, I don't know, uh, an elevation of like a, a parking lot, now you can place vehicles in a, a much more efficient way. And this functionality is not only for vehicles. We, we've built it into all of our generic blocks. Now, that's pretty cool, but we have other tools as well. Um, some of you guys might be familiar with the copy along line tool from um, planting, but I want to illustrate um, kind of the power of that and how it can also take advantage of dynamic blocks. So if I want to place a side amenity, um, maybe a boulder here, you can see this first boulder in my list, it's a uh, dynamic. And um, I happen to know that this one uses visibility states. So if I wanted to, let's say, place boulders along this arc, um, you know, I could place them all manually and then click and click and click, and then even go through and adjust the visibility states so that it's not the same boulder in each instance um, and make it look more organic. Um, um, and then, oh, it, I did copy along the line, I'm sorry. Copy along poly would drag it, but you can also have additional functionality once you're in your copy along line tools. Um, and you can see that you can use uh, A and D to adjust your spacing, which is very nice. So you can pull your boulders along the length of the line that you want them to be on. You can adjust your spacing and the tool actually even go as far as uh, changing the visibility states of that block for you, which I found really awesome. Um, it's just that extra layer of detail that makes your drawing look more organic. Um, this can save you a ton of time. Um, so we've kind of covered um, some types of blocks and some of the functionality associated with placing blocks. Um, but let's look at a, another tool that adds a, an entire new dimension to blocks is the, the site color tool. Uh, if you come up here to our ribbon and you select the site color tool. Sorry, I have it kind of big here. I'm going to shrink it down. You can see now all of my blocks have automatically had their color turned on. Um, we color all of our standard land effects blocks um, and the colors are easily editable. So if you like everything about a block, but you hate the color, uh, it's really easy to change. Um, the site color tool is really nice. It allows you just to, at the touch of a button, toggle on and off all of your color. And if you look over here, when I'm toggling my color, most of my blocks are changing, but you might notice here that my plant symbols are not changing. And that's because our plant symbols deal with color in a, in a slightly different way. Um, when you're dealing with plant symbols, uh, oftentimes the quantities can get really high. And so if you have too many uh, plant symbols that are really heavy on detail, it can bog down your drawing and decrease your, uh, your efficiency. So what we've opted for is a system that allows you to use um, any kind of plant symbol that you want, uh, simple or complex or even diagrammatic, but you can assign a separate um, rendered image to that plant. So if you come up here to our ribbon and you use the drop down menu uh, where the site color tool is, you will see our color render tool. So I'm going to go ahead and open the color render tool. And uh, a quick note if you are somebody who is familiar with plants, um, I apologize in advance because I did not take any care uh, to make sure these symbols were accurate. I just assigned them at random. But what you see here is every plant that I've added to my, my project. So these are all plants that I add, added to this drawing. And um, you can see them all here. And those are the original um, plant symbols that I chose. Now, if I want to assign color render symbols, all I have to do is choose the name of the plant that I want to change. And you'll see here I have a vast amount of symbols to choose from. Um, I, let's say I wanted a simple one like this. Then I could select it and then even further, I can choose a color that I'd like. Um, let's make this one pink maybe. So then you can go through and set up all of your plants the way you want them. And then just kind of like our site color tool at the touch of a button, all of your plants will render. This is a uh, really awesome. It allows you to get a uh, quick rendering right in CAD and you don't even have to do anything um, other than click a button. Now, if you don't wanna be working with all of your color symbols off. It's just as easy to turn them off. And there you go, it's on off. And I thought that was really cool because a big portion of my job is um, finding ways to make blocks more efficiently. 
and make them more higher performance. And that one is one of my favorites. Um, so real quick, before we move on, I wanted to touch on the command X list. Some of you guys might be familiar with this command. Um, it allows you to look at uh, data within a block. So if I type X list here, and it's going to prompt me to select an object. Let's say I wanted to look at this boulder. I see these different color lines in here, and uh, I just wanted to see what this pink one was. All I have to do is click on it, and then it gives me the information. Uh, it's pretty cool. I can see here what the, the layer name is. Uh, I can see that it's non-plot because of this little uh, suffix. Um, but while that command might be useful and nifty, uh, I want to recommend an even more powerful command. Uh, this one is called X layer. So if you type X layer, it's going to prompt you to select the object. So I can select the same object. And here we go. I see a slightly different um, dialog box. Now this is really cool because I can actually edit these uh, properties right here, right now. I don't have to do much. I can just click on the color. And let's say I wanted to change it to green. That's easy enough. Um, and I can even change the line, line type. Let's say I wanted to load a line type. Um, and I had a custom line type I wanted to use. Um, all I have to do is browse through till I find it. Say I wanted this one to be hidden and then apply it. So I can say, okay, and then choose it. And now you see here, I've got my new color and my new line type. I can click okay. And it's gonna update that throughout my drawing. So if you come over here to these fountains, you see they had a bunch of pink non-plot lines as well. Uh, but now these are set to my new standard. Um, so things like block optimization are gonna be really critical um, for your workflow. But before we get into that, Chair, uh, are there any questions on what we've gone over so far? Um, there were some really good questions and you know, I was able to uh, get to them. Uh, definitely, uh, um, and you might, you might be able to help with one of them was uh, someone asked if we have plans to do a plan view doors and windows. And I just don't know where in the, uh, where on our radar that is, if you happen to know, but I know we have the, the master Excel spreadsheet of our, you know, <laughs> your work for the next five years <laughs> planned out. <laughs> but I don't know, like if you know offhand about, you know, if plan view doors and windows had come up. Uh, they are on our radar. And the reason we haven't released them yet is because we're doing our best to come up with um, powerful dynamic versions uh, that would allow you to um, adjust them to standard sizes and such and uh, rotate and mirror. Um, but yeah, we do enjoy getting requests from, um, people. Uh, that's where a lot of our content comes from. Um, we do requests for, uh, people all the time. Um, architectural doors and windows plan view are on the radar. Um, but I don't have a specific date on, uh, when those are going to come up, but they are high on our list to do. Fantastic. All right, let's move on. Okay, um, because I've switched back to my um, slideshow now, I just wanna make sure everyone can see my screen. <laughs> yeah, it looks great. Okay, so let's go over some considerations for block creation. Um, let me preface this by saying, we know that everyone's gonna have their own office standards. Um, so take these with a grain of salt. These are our recommendations for how we make blocks. Um, and so much of the functionality of the system um, relies on the blocks being optimized correctly. So. If you're going to make your own blocks and you want them to work uh, as good as possible with land effects, uh, these are the steps we recommend that you take. Um, so on the left here, I have an image um, and it might look familiar. We were just browsing through the plan graphics and um, that mirrors your um, local folder structure. Um, and when I say local, you can see in the screenshot, uh, my file path is this PC local disk because that's the way I have it set up. If you were in an office where you had a shared land effects folder, uh, you'd wanna pay attention to uh, that first part of your file path. But once you find your block folder, you'll see that the folders in there mirror the file structure uh, when you're browsing in CAD. And this is because when you place one of those blocks, it'll know automatically where to download it. Um, you can see that um, there's numbers before the folders. Um, those are not anything that you're going to have to worry about or uh, deal with. That's just so that the system can order the, the folders properly. 
Um, <clears throat> some advantages to our system is that it's a uh, super time saving. Um, in that image, I have kind of an example of uh, what we used to use in school for old master sheets and we'd copy and paste our blocks from one drawing to the other and have to deal with scale and, and everything like that. So the cloud system is super nice because it's just, you can look at them right in CAD and place them with no headaches. Um, uh, when you download a block, it's gonna come with a, a DWG and an XML file um, and a slide file. This is super useful because the XML file can store metadata about the block that allows us to do more with the block than the standard uh, AutoCAD method of managing blocks. Uh, you can deal with rotation and scale and um, much more than just a default block. Um, you can see that uh, we have a number of tools that work with blocks, so it's important um, that you have those XML files that they download automatically, and uh, we'll look a little bit more at that in a little bit. Um, we also keep all of our blocks um, organized and they all adhere to a strict naming convention. Um, this naming convention is a little bit complex, especially when you first look at it, um, but there are a couple of takeaways that I wanna drive home so that when you're working with your own blocks, whether that be um, editing ours to make them your own or simply adding your own blocks to our system, there's gonna be some important um, tips that you wanna pay attention to. Uh, and this is gonna be recorded and these um, slides will be available later if you wanna look at them, but we also have a really good knowledge base. Um, there's articles that can walk you through all of this in detail. Um, but if you see up in the top image, uh, the color-coded uh, naming convention example, uh, the prefix is LAFX. So AutoCAD requires us to register um, a prefix with them. Um, so it's a unique uh, identifier that instantly uh, identifies all of our blocks. Um, while you're not required to register your own prefix, we strongly urge you to use your own because it'll allow you to instantly see um, blocks that are yours versus ours versus uh, blocks that you've received from other um, firms and such. So if you uh, have your own prefix, that's great. And then um, there's a good address analogy that you can look at. Um, the category code is basically the state. Um, the subcategory code would be the city. Uh, the block number would be your street address. And then the D stands for dynamic. So if you can kind of just keep that in your mind when you're structuring your own blocks, uh, it'll be really helpful for you. Um, next, I wanted to touch on layers. Layers are critically important uh, for block creation. Um, all of your layers will have specific properties and um, those properties are gonna interact with other functions of CAD. So it's important that you have them set properly. Otherwise you run the risk of having issues with your blocks. Um, we recommend using layer states. We provide um, some generic layer states that are preset. Um, you can open these in your drawing before you even uh, start your drawing if you're doing a block. And these will get you close to the layers we recommend. Uh, if you wanna modify those for your own standards, you can. Um, when you go to print uh, your blocks and you wanna see how it'll look on paper, um, the CTB file is what interacts with your layer settings and it's gonna assign things such as uh, line weights and such. And this is important because you wanna strike a balance of your blocks between detail and legibility. Um, and this is an example I wanted to show. Um, if you look at the top image, that's uh, what those fountains look like in model space. So you can see there's different color lines in there. Um, we've got red and dark red and pink, and all of those have specific properties that are gonna correlate in the CTB so that when you look at the bottom image, that is what the blocks will look like when you print them. You can see a lot of the lines are not plotted um, and some of them have different line weights. This, um, is our, an example of our layer states. So if you were to navigate to your FX admin tab, you could load layers um, and then choose one of our generic, or not generic, but choose one of our layer states. You can see uh, the one that I have highlighted. It's um, generic block layers. These are what I use when I'm creating blocks. Uh, these are my preferences for my layer setup. Um, you don't have to use these. It's easy enough to save your own with the save layers tool. I uh, just wanted to show you guys the importance and the time-saving features of layer states. So if you wanted to 
um, take a look at this. I don't want to spend too much time here, but these are our, gen our general block creation guidelines. These are what we always look at when we are uh, creating blocks from scratch specifically. Um, you always want to set your units, uh, get your layer states loaded, get your preference set all set up, um, and you want to make sure you draw that the elements of the block at full size. And uh, this one is important because when your blocks are coming in, uh, you want them to scale correctly. Um, we kind of just touched on striking a balance between detail and legibility. Um, if you draw your blocks with too much detail and then you want to print them, uh, you run the risk of when you zoom out and you're looking at a larger area, your blocks is turning into dark, muddy little splotches. <laughs> um, you want to make sure that your line work is always clean uh, and you want to try to stick to polylines, arcs, and circles. Um, certain things like uh, splines and stuff can cause some serious headaches with other tools later on. Um, the insertion point of your block is important. You want to make sure that's uh, set to zero, zero. And the reason this is important is because you don't want to select a block and then place it in CAD and have it show up, show up somewhere else, uh, off in space. You want to make sure that where you click, the block comes in. And then you want to make sure that your block is, uh, uh, not the block, but the drawing the block is saved in is free of proxies, XREF, um, extraneous textiles and that sort of thing. Um, proxies and such can get in there and they're, they're easy to miss. So you, you want to make sure you run purge on your drawings and get all that extra clutter out of there. This is the checklist that we run through um, for reviewing our blocks. And um, you can see here that there's a lot of overlap and that's because there's a lot of things that we want to make sure we don't miss. Um, uh, you, again, you can print this out and follow along with this checklist if you like, or come up with your own, but those are the things that we like to look at. A um, couple of quick notes. Uh, running the purge commands, um, infinitely important. It runs purge a number of times and it, it'll get a lot of that extra uh, stuff out of your drawing. And then uh, we recommend saving your drawings as 2013 format. Um, it just allows them to be uh, more generally compatible. Um, and then I wanted to now talk about how you can save some of your blocks and uh, some ways to save different types of blocks. So I'm going to switch over to CAD here. It looks like my screen should be sharing. Yeah, it looks great. Okay. So when you're saving your always, uh, when you're saving your own blocks, you always want to really make sure that you back up your blocks. Um, the folder structure we talked about before, if you want to integrate your blocks into our folder structure, that's fine. Um, but it's critically important to back them up because if something were to change, uh, we don't back your blocks up for you. Um, there are definitely different ways to save blocks. Um, first, I want to kind of talk about the normal uh, vanilla uh, AutoCAD way of saving a block. And then I want to talk to you about um, why we recommend using a different method. So if you look here, I have just a collection of line work and hatches and such. And, um, I'll select it all and I'll show you up here. It's three hatches and 73 polylines. So you could imagine if you had to move and copy that around a bunch, it would be a pain. So if you wanted to make it a block using the normal AutoCAD method, you could select your items and then just type block. And then you're given this dialog box. So this allows you to give your block a name um, and allows you to specify your pick point. Uh, the pick point, you want it to be zero, zero, um, and in my case, this block was already set up at zero, zero, so I'm, I'm okay. But if you were um, working, let's say, in a, a drawing that had multiple blocks and you were creating more than one block at a time, you'd want to really make sure to set the pick point correctly. Um, and as you can see here, uh, you do get some options for annotative and scale, but there's nothing for rotation or really anything beyond this, uh, these behavior options. Um, and another thing with this method when saving blocks is your units are critically important because whatever you set the block to, it's always going to come in at those inches or at those uh, units. So if you set it to inches and you were working in a different unit, the block could come in at, at a different size and that would uh, be a little bit frustrating. Um, and then you would click OK and it would save your block. Um, but I don't want to do that in this example. What I want to do is I want to talk about uh, the different ways that you can save blocks into the land effects. Um, and why we recommend doing uh, creating your blocks this way. If you look up here uh, under my site tab um, and I click the drop down menu where it says blocks, you'll see save block. So 
So I can use this tool to save a block, uh, a site block, or I could come over here to my planting tab and I could look uh, under generic plants and I could save a, block, a plant block. Um, or I could come down here to details and this one's really cool. And I can uh, drop down graphics and I could save a detail block. Now, these are all gonna be a little bit different because they're gonna automate a lot of the, the settings for you. Um, but they're all equally powerful and equally useful. Um, the detail block one would be really nice because let's say you're working in a detail and you had to draw like something small, like a screw, and you didn't want to have to draw that over and over or copy and paste it. You could just save the detail block right then and there. And then as you're working on your details, you'd have that block in your system. Um, but for this one, uh, it's a site block. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to choose save block from our, our site ribbon. And um, it's going to ask us for the insertion point. If you look at my command line, um, I happen to know this one's at zero, zero, and I, I could click and select um, a, a pick point and, and use my OSNAP settings to choose that. But because I know this one's at zero, zero, I'm going to um, just type it and not run the risk of getting the wrong insertion point. And if you look at my command line, now it's prompting me to select my object. So I can go ahead and I can select everything in this drawing. And if I hit enter, I'm going to get this dialog box. So I'm going to want to give this block a name. Um, let's do webinar test block. Okay, and then it's going to um, prompt me to choose where I want to save it. And if you see here, these are uh, going to be my default folders. And if you try to save it outside of the folder, it'll tell you to, to pick a proper one. So there's uh, not really much risk in putting this too, too far off in the wrong place. Uh, but this one's an elevation graphic. Um, this is a really big sign or like a kiosk. So I'm gonna put it under structures and then kiosks. Um, or how about for this example, we'll put it under uh, um, pavilions just to show you, you can put it wherever you want. And then we're gonna save this one as webinar test block. Um, so there you have it. Now it's gonna automatically shoot a slide. And um, this slide turned out nice because the only thing I had in this drawing was this um, set of line work. Now, if you put, um, if you were doing this in a, a master sheet and you had a number of blocks you were making, uh, a lot of these slides could get messed up and I'll show you how to fix those later. Um, you could give it a description if you'd like, um, but here you can see we have the option to set rotation to manual or none. Um, because this is an elevation block, I'm going to leave it at no rotation, but uh, rotation is really useful for a lot of plan blocks. Um, and then for my scale, I'm just going to leave this one at one to one and I'm going to leave it in inches. Um, we can leave this one in inches because uh, saving blocks using our methods uh, is going to allow you to um, not have to worry about that. It's going to automatically set the scale for you. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And now if you see here, I still just have my, my original line work. But if I come back up here to my block tool and I navigate to where we saved it, elevation graphics, uh, and then we put this one under uh, gazebos, because we wanted to show that it was in a different spot. Or was it under kiosks? It was under kiosks. And then here's my webinar test block. Um, and you can see here, now I have my preview slide, and now I can just spec it like any other block, and, and I can place it. And see, now we have our collection of line work, which is 76 items, or we have our one block. Um, so that's kind of how you would go through saving a standard site block um, using the land effects method. But what about if you had your own block pre-made and you just wanted to add it to our system? Or what if you had a block that was on paper space? Um, let's take a look at that. I have an example here. Um, you can see I have a sheet template um, in paper space. And what I wanted to show you guys was this seal. Uh, you might have a similar one. Um, and this one is actually two inches. I, I dimensioned it here just for reference. Um, and you can see that it, it, this is the actual size we want it in two inches on paper space. But if you were to place this in model space, it'd be really tiny. Um, so let's go ahead and select the block. Um, as you can see up here, it's a block reference. So this would be maybe something that you have. Um, and then you can just as easily save this one in. So let's go ahead and uh, do save block. And let's select our insertion point. I'm going to select this one right here in the middle. 
Um, and I had to select that one manually um, again because it was not already set to zero, zero. And then I have a name here. Um, let's name this one something unique for this instance. We'll call this one webinar test. And then it's gonna ask me again where I wanna save it. Um, let's put this one in discipline graphics and then I'm gonna use my user defined uh, folder. And I'm gonna save it here. So go ahead and hit save. And then I'm gonna rename it and you will see here, it shot my slide and it, it got everything else in the drawing in my slide. So I'm gonna show you how to fix that. But really quick, we're gonna set everything uh, as is because I don't wanna change anything. And I'm gonna say, okay, it's gonna save. Um, now, when I go to preview for that block, user defined, you will see here, my slide isn't looking very good. So let's, let's go fix that. So what I wanna do now is go over to my local folder. Here we go. And you will see here, um, I've already navigated to my land effects blocks folder. Um, this one might look different for you. Uh, let's go to discipline graphics, user defined. And here we go, webinar test. So this is the block we just made. And you can see it has our XML file, our slide file and our DWG. If you wanna adjust the, um, slide all you have to do is open the source block you can see here it's pretty small so we'll zoom in and here's the block so if you want to shoot the slide it's super easy you just have to use a command called m slide um, but the one thing to know about m slide is um, again if i just sh shot the slide with this drawing uh, as is it would be the only item in the drawing it would automatically zoom appropriately but let's pretend you had a number of blocks in this drawing uh, what you want to do to get a clean slide is um, change your uh, model space to kind of frame the block. So <clears throat> the way I'm going to do that is open my site color tool. I can use my uh, layer manager or anything else and just make this a nice frame for my block. So now my block is decently framed. All I have to do is run the command M slide. So I type M slide and I hit enter. And there you go. It automatically gives me the name that it, it, it expects. And if I go to say save, it's gonna warn me if I wanna replace it. So I'm gonna go ahead and say yes. So now that I've overwritten the old slide, let's go back and uh, let's look. So let's go to blocks, discipline graphics, user defined, and there you have it. We have a good slide. Um, <clears throat> Another useful tool that you can use that I uh, kind of skipped over before is a redefine block. So let's go back here to our presentation file. And you remember these uh, uh, mailboxes we edited. Well, let's say you changed your mind and you wanted to revert this back to the source block. You can easily use the command redefine block. And there you have it. Uh, it's gonna ask you to select the block. We can just pick any instance of this and it automatically goes back to the source uh, definition. So that kind of wraps up uh, how to optimize blocks. Do we have any other questions? Well, let's see. I was able to answer them. Um, now is a great time to get in uh, any of your other questions that you would like answered. Um, we did have a few people who mentioned the uh, duplicate uh, block folders. So I was giving them the steps on, on how to do that from our little reorganization. Um, more info on that is, you know, as we, uh, as we staffed up and started planning out, okay, you know, let's redo our entire block library and colorize everything and come up with alternate views and all these things. As you can imagine, we realized that the original structure that we had created for the block library was a little lacking. And so it just, we were going to have to alter it. But the, the worst that happens is, yeah, um, some of those folders um, can be duplicated. And then, but we have a KB article, which is there in the answered questions on how to um, address that. Um, so but if anyone wanted more information on that, please put in a question. Um, I don't see any questions coming in yet. So maybe um, if you wanted to go to jump to, um, I forget, what, what was the thing we said we were going to show? <laughs> uh, I had an example of a dynamic block, um, but those were more involved. But we do have a few minutes. I can, I can run through that. And that, well, we did have a good one is, um, 
Uh, well, I guess so. So we had, we, had, we had a question just asking about um, color plant blocks, which we did show earlier. So, so yeah, just go ahead and um, go with that and I'll answer that question now. Okay. Um, so dynamic blocks, we discussed them a little bit, um, but we only briefly touched an, on them and we kind of only went over one type of block, which was uh, dynamic blocks that utilize uh, different visibility states. Um, but if we come over here, I have in this drawing, it's just a single bench. I don't have anything else in here. Um, but let's say I wanted to, to make this a dynamic block. Uh, it's as easy as uh, opening it in the block editor. Um, and then let me go ahead. Oh, I didn't hit enter, sorry. Let me select my object. Oh, block edit, sorry. Type block edit and then it's gonna I'll give me the option, what? Okay, let's do it this way. I can just type block, select my objects and then uh, give the block a name. And again, this is the standard AutoCAD function. So we'll just call this one dynamic bench. And then uh, I'm gonna specify the pick point at zero, zero. Um, but again, I've already got this one set up the way I want it. Um, and then I'm gonna make sure down here, I check this box that says open in block editor. So I can go ahead and open this in the block editor and then I'm gonna close my site color tab here. So um, dynamic blocks are really complex and I don't wanna um, confuse anyone too much. We have really good videos on this, but I will kind of give you some basics. So the way dynamic blocks work are you have parameters and you have actions. Now, the, prom the parameter is gonna basically um, tell the block uh, how to act or like what, what it's gonna do. And then you assign an action to the parameter. And let me, let me illustrate this for you. Let's say I wanna add a linear parameter to this block because I wanna be able to stretch it as long as I wanna make it. So all I have to do is select the parameter. And if you look at my command line down there, it's gonna give you some options. Um, but I wanna keep this one simple and I just wanna specify the whole length of my bench. And then it's gonna ask me where I wanna set my label. And I'm gonna put it up here above my bench. So now there's a linear property associated with the length of my bench. Um, if I look at this um, parameter and I come over here to the, the properties, I'm gonna have some more control over it. If you see, I have two grips. Um, there are these arrows here, these are called grips. Uh, I'm only gonna want this uh, bench to stretch in one direction for this example. So I, I'm gonna come down here to number of grips and I'm gonna change it from zero, one or two, and I'm gonna make it one. Uh, now you can see I just have my single grip over here. And um, this is gonna be important because this is gonna uh, show up when I place this block, when it's done. Um, now I want to assign an action to my distance parameter. So I need to tell it what I want it to do with this distance parameter. Um, and remember, um, this is a default name of distance one. I could change this to whatever I want, but it, it, it is a linear parameter. I said distance parameter, I meant to say linear. Um, so let's pick an action and let's uh, do a stretch action. So if I select it and look at my command line, it's gonna ask me to select my parameter. So I'll go ahead here and I'll select the parameter. And now it's asking me to specify a grip. And as you remember, we just made it one grip. So let's make sure we specify the correct one. And now it's gonna ask you to uh, specify your uh, stretch frame. And this is just like you would use um, a normal stretch command. So we're just gonna window over and create the area that we want the block to stretch on. And now it's gonna ask us to select our objects. So this is important because this is the easy one to mess up. You only wanna select the objects that you want the uh, action and parameter to apply to. And it would be easy to select the whole bench, but you would actually uh, find that that didn't work out well for you. So what I wanna do is just make sure I select these same items uh, that I want to stretch, but I'm gonna leave out um, this end, this uh, other armrest on this end. And now I can click enter. And you will see here that it's showing my stretch, my stretch action has um, been applied to my parameter. Um, so now let's go ahead and test this. You can come up here and use this button called test block. And without leaving the block editor, it's gonna give you a workspace. So um, this is gonna be super important if you make dynamic blocks for troubleshooting them because um, they're very easy to, to make buggy and sometimes you have to troubleshoot them a few times to get them right. So here now, this is what the block would look like if I placed it in, in 
model space. Um, and if I selected it, you would see I have the one grip. And we made sure to only have one. And now when I click it, it's not a drop down menu like visibility states. Now it's giving me free reign of my mouse to stretch this bench. Um, I could make it more complicated and I could make it stretch at set intervals. Um, but for this simple example, we'll just make it uh, free flowing. You can set it to whatever specific distance you want. Um, and then once you have your block acting the way you want it in the test, you can come up here and you can uh, choose close test block. And this is gonna close it out for you. And, and now your block is good to go. Um, does anybody have any questions regarding um, how to make a dynamic block? No, I don't see any rolling in. So um, um, I think, uh, you know, we were able to wow everybody pretty well. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, the one takeaway I'd like to stress is, again, is how much we really do rely on you letting us know what sorts of blocks you need. Um, one of my favorite examples was that uh, someone said we didn't have anything with horses and they were working on an equestrian park. And we're like, that's true. We, you know, we had people, but we didn't have a person riding a horse. And so we added some of those, you know, and so we really do need that sort of input. Uh, we just never would have thought of putting a person on a horse <laughs> unless someone told us. <laughs> so you got to tell us those sort of things. We really do appreciate that. Um, but yeah, I think we're going to call it and just wish everyone a safe and happy weekend. <laughs>